Now, I want to tell you a little bit what's coming up at Pleasant View from uh, the beginning of August to December. <laughs> it's a long way off, right? But we are going to start this morning a series, an eight-part series called Follow. This is an important series, I think, for our church. And we're going to look at what it means, what it is to follow Jesus. What does that look like? You know, what, what is it all about? I think this morning's message is going to challenge us in ways we haven't been. That's going to be followed by a nine-week series called The One and Others. We're going to be talking about what the New Testament talks about, love one another, encourage one another, build one another up, you know, those kinds of things. There's a lot of them in Scripture. And I think God really laid this on my heart when I was planning out this whole schedule because, you know, as a church, I thought we do pretty good at the one another's. But COVID changed my mind a little bit because our church and many other churches did not do well with one another's. And I think it's very important as Christians, we examine that, we look at it. And I think to this body, we're going on as a body on an adventure for the next eight and nine weeks. And I would encourage you, I think it's important, uh, if you can't be here Sunday, watch it before the next Sunday. Go online and watch it. Tie into this series. It, I just feel that powerful. Uh, some of the material that in follow is from uh, Andy Stanley. The material on the one another is going to be all out of the New Testament. So I just want you to be aware of that. This morning I want to talk about Jesus says. Now what do I mean by that? Anybody play Simon Says? You ever play Simon Says? Simon Says this, Simon Says that. Oops, Simon didn't say that, right? Well, I think so often as a Christian, and I think that we go through phases, and some people are stuck in this phase, where we play Jesus Says. Jesus says, pray. Jesus says, read your Bible. Jesus says, you know, uh, look at that. Jesus didn't say, look at her. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. It's, it's do's and don'ts. That's what so many times I hear from non-Christians. People outside of the church will say, all the church is is do this, don't do that. And it's like you don't do anything that's fun. And sometimes I think they're right. Sometimes I think they're right because when we focus so much on what to do and what not to do, when we focus so much on law and what isn't law, it takes the enjoyment out of things. And I know that at one point in my life, I stepped out of Jesus Says and did what Jay said, and that didn't work well either, but at least at the time, I was having fun, all right? Because I didn't understand. I listened to so many people because the Jesus Says means it cares more about how you behave how you look, how you act. Is it right in our church? Right? I mean, let's be very honest. That's how we, we do it so many times. It's like, what are you wearing? I don't think a Christian would wear that. What are you saying? I don't think a Christian would say that. You know, those things, what we do, 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 don't, don't, don't. And frankly, I get tired. I, get, I got tired of that. I got tired of playing Jesus said and a step away from it. And if I step back into it, what happens to us so often is we get very good at what Jesus says. We get so good that as we say it, and we, we don't move when Jesus doesn't say, when, but we'll look at other people and say, ha, 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 you're out. And we start to judge and compare. Judge and compare. And suddenly you realize we're just like the Pharisees. We're just like Sadducees. And we can do that. We can be 
really good, really holy, and we get so good at it that we forget who we are. We do. And we become that judge. And we evaluate. And we compare how good we are compared to everybody else. You ever see the movie, any of you, Men in Black? Do you remember the thing that they would flash so everybody forgets what they're doing? Forget what they just saw? I honestly wish I could do that this morning. I wish I could take and all of our biases, all of our ideas of Christianity, so many of us, we came up and we maybe in this church, that church, whatever, we, we have this concept of what it is, and I wish I could just take the thing and go woof, and all that would be gone, and we could start brand new. Because what I'm gonna do is challenge us to do just that. I want us to pretend that I don't know this, because you're gonna fight your bias this morning, I guarantee it, all right? My goal, really, is not to offend you, but make you a little uncomfortable. I hope that we go home and we talk about some of this over the dinner table. All right? I'm just, I'm, I want you to be prepared as we go into this. Because I wish that what we could do was without all the bias, without everything we were raised in, without that, that we could, for the first time, imagine reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm putting that more important than anything else. But what I mean is we're going to talk about following Jesus to be a follower of Jesus, what that means. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all about the people who first followed Jesus. All right? Personal testimonies. Luke wrote his book. Now, he wasn't one of the followers, but he wrote it from the other disciples and put his book together. So they're all personal accounts of follow. We're going to look this morning into Matthew chapter 9. Because I want you to realize something, and and I think we do, but sometimes we lose this concept. When we become a Christian, one of the things that we tell people is, you can have a what? Relationship with Jesus. Personal, right? Personal. That's important, because Jesus came. God in the flesh came to have a relationship with us. In fact, not just a normal relationship, he wants an extraordinary relationship. This is God. He came for us. We didn't come for him. He came for us. He wants to have this extraordinary relationship. Following Christ is all about a relationship. But see, so often we get these filters, we get these biases, uh, right or wrong, that doesn't matter, except so often they mess us up. And they mess up our idea of what following Christ is about. Jesus talked about three different relationships that when we think about this, if you think the Jews who worship God They wouldn't call him God. They called him Jehovah. They had all these names. You can do studies in the name. It's really interesting. It's amazing. It shows characteristics of God. But Jesus comes, and he keeps referring to God as the Father, as the Father. His example of how we're to relate to God, his first example is father-child. We can relate to that, can't we? We can understand that. It's an amazing thing when we think, wait a minute, for the very first time, I don't need a priest. I don't need somebody between me. God is my father. There is this, I can go there. I can talk to him. A relationship, okay? See, it's very important. The second relationship he talks about is very important. He talks about the story of the vine and the branches. He says, I am the vine. You're the branches. What do branches need? We need the food. We need the support of the vine. We can't break off and go on our own. We can't do it. We dry up and die. But when we are attached to the vine, he says we produce fruit. Life is fantastic. 
Because the life flows from him. It's relationship. We are tied together. It's an amazing picture. If you can, if you can just visualize how important that relationship is. The third one is much more difficult for us to understand. We can understand it to a degree. Is the shepherd and the sheep. We are the sheep. Christ is the shepherd. And we say, well, I understand that. You have a shepherd. He watches over the sheep. Yep. But if you don't have sheep, and if you're not familiar with how they work and think and everything, the relationship that Jesus is talking about is deep. You would have a shepherd. He could have 100 sheep. And they would come in, and at night they would corral. But that, there would be other shepherds using the same corral. So you could have three, four, five hundred sheep all together put in there. Next morning, the shepherds come. And the first shepherd will open the gate and he calls his sheep. He has a name. And his sheep, Jesus says, know his voice. When they hear their shepherd, even though they're with all the other sheep, they come to him. He takes them out. That's an amazing thing. Because sheep, sheep aren't the smartest animal God ever created. All right? But they know the voice of the shepherd. To know the voice of the shepherd is an amazing relationship. And that's what Jesus is basically saying it is about. He is this relationship. He is the connection. No one goes to the Father but by me. That's how. I, you can go to the Father through me. You can say, like Paul says, Daddy God. That's relationship. It's all about relationships. I think if you approach your spirituality or religion or if you approach Christianity, is anything less than a relationship. I think you missed the boat. I think you have missed the boat. And the tie, our whole tie through this series is one word. Follow. Follow. We will see as we go through this that Jesus extends the invitation to follow to simply every person imaginable. Every person imaginable. You know, a lot of us in church, we, boy, if we had certain people or whatever come in, I read the story about a pastor who was brand new to a church. And his first Sunday, he dressed up like a homeless person. He was dirty. He was nasty looking. And he was outside the church. Nobody asked him in. Nobody offered to help. He heard complaints, everything else. They were shocked when he walked in and came up front and introduced himself as their new pastor and told him we have a lot of work to do. See, Jesus didn't care. He offered the invitation to every person imaginable, everyone. Didn't matter if you were rich or poor or spiritual, or you didn't have any kind of spirituality, you were an atheist, you didn't believe, he offered to follow. Follow. Follow me. Now in the book of Matthew, in chapter 9, we're going to start with verse 9, we are going to see this section of scripture that Matthew is writing, but he's writing his story. He's saying, this is how I came to be Matthew the Apostle. All right? Now, it says in Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, you've heard me talk about this before, but those of you may did not. Matthew was a tax collector, and a tax collector was the lowest scum of the earth. All right? That's what they were thought of. Why? They were Jewish people who worked for the Roman government 
Rome was in control of Palestine, all of Judea, all of Israel. And if you were Jewish, you felt that you couldn't work for the, Jew, for the Romans because that would be like betraying your nation, being unfaithful to your people. But there were Jews who became tax collectors because they made a lot of money. They made money, but the Romans would say, look, and Rome taxed about everything, but we Americans, we're about used to that, right? We get taxed for everything too. So here we have the Romans taxing everything, and they would have, Matthew apparently was set up near a dock, and they were taxing his fish, and how many fish you caught, it was worth so much, and it was like if you owed $100 in tax, Matthew would say, your tax today is $200. $100 for the Romans, $100 for me. That's how they made it. That's how they got paid. They were allowed to do that by Roman law. So you work for the Romans, which the Jews hated, despised, so you were a traitor, and you, you abused your people. You abused them by overtaxing, overcharging. They were your people, and this is how you did. So you have to understand that almost to the degree that if there was a murderer, they considered the tax collector below that. Just scum of the earth, okay? So I want you to have that picture that you know this. And um, Matthew writes that here comes this rabbi, and he has about four followers right now, the fishermen. And he walks up to Matthew, and he simply says, Hey, Matthew, follow me. That's all he said. As Jesus went out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And the amazing thing to me is, he says, Matthew got up and followed him. And I've got to be honest, I'm looking at that and saying, Matthew, what's the deal? You simply got up and closed your business, and you followed him. And you've got to understand, he's not just following him to say, hey, Matthew, let me, let me go talk with you down the street. Let me see if I can straighten out you rotten sinner tax collector. That's not what he's doing. When he says, follow me, he's a rabbi. He's a Jewish rabbi. And it was common that Jewish teachers would gather people, certain people, and they would do a journey together, a life journey it was not easy. It was often rugged and hard. And you know that Jesus said he didn't, have, he didn't own anything. So what he had was on his back. He carried with him. So here was a very wealthy tax collector. Come on, Matthew. And I can tell you that Peter was, that, that, uh, Peter was with him, and Peter's freaking out. Peter's freaking out. You, you can bet on it. Because he didn't like tax collectors at all. And he's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. If, he, if you ask him to follow, that means we've, we got, we got to follow with him. No. No one will listen to us. We have scum with us. We'll get, we can't hang with him. We'll get tax collector cooties or something, you know? It'd be awful. I can hear them saying, I want you to understand. It didn't matter to Jesus who Matthew was. He didn't say to Matthew, you have to stop doing this, this, and do this, this, this. Matthew, you got to first clean up. I'll come back and see you in three weeks. We'll see how you look. I'll give you a quiz, see if you can measure up to us now, and then be a part of my group. And the church, we've done that way too often. Way too often, we, we, we judge people by how they look on the outside. That's what Pharisees do. They can be rotten on the inside. Remember Jesus saying that? You clean the outside of the cup and you look in, there's fungus growing. What's wrong with you people? You know what I mean? He says, you look like whitewashed tombs. Oh, you're pretty. You keep the outside looking, the way you dress, the way you do, and the way you walk, and inside you're full of death. We Christians don't like to think on that level, but we walk there often. 
because we're not so accepting of other people in all situations and who they are. But Jesus was. Now, the interesting thing is, as Jesus is moving about, and this is early in his ministry, he is being shadowed by Pharisees and Sadducees. They follow from a distance. They watch everything he's doing. They're confused about him. Who is he? What's up with him? All of a sudden, here hear all these things he's doing, miracles he's doing. How can this be? And the Pharisees, they play, you know, they play the law says, the law says. They play that all the time. But Jesus doesn't play that game. If I was to say to you this morning, do you know what's in John 11? You may or may not know. If somebody told me right off the bat, yeah, it's about Lazarus. That would tell me you know the Bible. But it doesn't tell me if you know the Savior. It doesn't tell me if your heart's right. The Pharisees knew the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, by heart. They had to do it forward and backwards to become a full-fledged Pharisee. That would be what we would say, knowing the Bible, right? But it never got in their heart. It never entered their heart. What I want us to do over the next eight weeks is to look in the mirror and ask this question. Am I following? Am I a follower? That's a simple question. I'm not concerned. You mean, you're, you mean am I a Christian? That's not what I asked you. I asked you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Are we following? Now again, that seems very simple. After all, shouldn't we go over the Roman road, say a prayer, confess sins? My question is, did Jesus do that? What was he concerned about first was relationship. Relationship. One of the reasons you don't hear me do too many altar calls is on this very principle. I want to take a journey with you. I want to walk beside you. I want to be your encouragement and builder. You will be mine. I have a lot to learn from you, no matter who you are, or where you're from, or what you've done. And I would rather follow Jesus, lean in a little, just to see Because I've seen too often people go along on the road, on the prayer, and never establish the relationship of walking with someone. And then Jesus does something totally off the, off the record, totally flips the Pharisees out. He not only says, Matthew, follow me, and as they leave and his disciples are like, I can imagine that Jesus and Matthew are up here talking and the others are like 50 yards behind them. All right? And I believe, honestly, that's, that's how it was. And Jesus probably says, puts his arms around Matthew and said, Matthew, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to eat dinner at your house today. How about that? And you know what's really neat about that? Because Jesus who asked him to follow, and he moved, he, he made a choice to follow. But what's really cool is Jesus is saying, let's go where you're comfortable. I want to go to your house where you're comfortable. And Matthew gets pretty excited about this. He gets so excited, he's not only telling his people, 
you know, his servants and things, get this dinner, we're going to have this big feast. He goes and somehow connects in a short time all the other tax collectors and sinners. Now, sinners were probably the people that worked for the tax collectors, helped them. Sort of in that group, because I'm going to tell you a lot of sinners wouldn't eat with tax collectors. They just wouldn't. So these sinners had to be people who were associated with the tax collectors. And Jesus sits down, and in this whole group, all these people who were nothing like Jesus, all culture and society says, this is the scum, this is the lowest snakes on all the earth. You are God. You claim to be a Messiah. You claim to be a holy man. And you are with all these nasty people. <laughs> well, Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners. It goes on. I want to tell you something very important about Jesus. I'm not sure, I forget if it's in your notes, but it's worth writing down. If not, it's honestly amazing when you think about this, that Jesus was extraordinarily comfortable with people who were nothing like him. I mean, do we, we realize that God in the flesh, God in the flesh, sat down and was eating and having, talking to these people who were nothing like him, who were used to taking advantage of people, who were hated by everybody else. And Jesus is in there, and they're talking and doing all these things. He was so comfortable with people who were nothing like him. And church, are we? Let me tell you something. If you're here for the first time today, and you feel anything less than love and respect, Please do not blame our Savior. It's our fault. Because Jesus was not that way. Jesus was comfortable with any person. Any person. He loves us. He respected them. And if we do anything out less, anything less, I will ask for forgiveness. Because Jesus is not that way. The Pharisees, they're outside. They play, you know, the, the, they're like playing the Jesus says game, but it's, it's, it's the law says, and they're flipping out. It says, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciple, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? How can he do this? He says, look, he's, he's a rabbi. We're teachers. He, he says he, he loves God. We worship and love God. He's a law keeper. Remember, Jesus told him, he said, I came to fulfill the law. I keep the law, do it. We're law keepers. But we would never, ever, ever eat with tax collectors and these sinners here. We would never do it. It's filthy. See, we believe, we believe what's right. We dress what's right. We act what's right. And everybody in our group has to do that. Does that ever sound like church sometimes? Does that ever sound like the body? That's a Pharisee. Jesus didn't play that game. Jesus said, I'm not doing that. I'm not. Follow me. Follow me. He can sit down, and he was comfortable with everybody else. In fact, he's so comfortable. If you think about this scene, what's, what happens next is sort of weird. It, it's, well, I think it's extremely awkward. It's, he's sitting there with all the tax collectors and all their helpers, all right, tax collectors and sinners. In verse 12, he says, he hears about the disturbance with the disciples. So he says this. On hearing this, Jesus said, hey, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
Now, you're sitting there with Jesus, you're having this feast, everybody's talking, they're listening to him, and then Matthew's sitting there and sort of scratches his head. Can you get this picture? And say, hey, Jesus, teacher, you're in my house. I invited you in, and are you saying we're sick? You think, see, that, that would be awkward, wouldn't it? It's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I gathered church this morning, I worship with a whole bunch of nasty sinners. True, but it doesn't sound good, does it? And Jesus, he has this tremendous ability. He has this relational quality. He's so comfortable with people, they actually get comfortable with him. And he said, Matthew, of course you're sick. Can you imagine that? Matthew, of course you're sick. And everybody around, what I can picture, all the other guys are looking and said, yeah, Matthew, we're all sick. High five, you know, boom, 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 yeah. Why? Because we are. And what Jesus was saying, Matthew, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm telling you the truth. You're lost. You're separated from God. You're sick. And I'm here for you. I want to have a relationship with you. And even though it seems awkward, everybody began to know it. We are. I'm a sinner. And you know what? Too often we get saved by grace. We have God's mercy and we think we're no longer a sinner. That we're better than everybody else and we begin to look down and we become the Pharisee. Exactly what we have become. We lose sight of it. I love what happens next because, you know, Jesus sort of offends everybody in Matthew's house. Now he's going to continue offending people. He's going to offend the Pharisees. But he says this to them. He says, here's what you need to do, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He's basically telling them, I didn't come for you guys because you guys won't ever admit you need it. They didn't need it. They needed Jesus. But see, the righteous, the, those that think they're righteous, those that think we're so holy, so mighty, we forget that we were sinners and still sin. We think we don't need Jesus. I know one thing. I want to be with people who believe the right thing, behave the right thing, and behave to the right things in order to call people who don't believe the right thing and don't behave the right way, who know there is something else, something better. I want to be with those people who never forget that they were other people and they have leaned in and they've become a follower of Jesus. And when you become a true follower of Jesus, you want everybody to be a follower of Jesus. Why is it important? You know, it's great you know the Roman road. It's great you know how to lead somebody in a sinner's prayer or whatever we want to call it. That's great. I'm not condemning that. But I would much rather when we say, hey, how about, you know what? You wonder about Jesus. You don't believe in Jesus. It's cool. I understand that. How about you just walk with me? How about you just lean in a little bit and, and follow him. How about you open Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for the first time. Read eyewitnesses' testimony to what it was like to follow Jesus. And maybe, just maybe, you don't have to do anything. I'm not asking you to change anything. But I'll tell you, when you do that, you will change. You will. Because following Jesus it's like no relationship or journey that you've been on. It's amazing. And when people can say, hey, you, wanna, you know what? If you don't want to, that's okay. I'm not going to bug you about this, but I'd love you to come to church sometime. Just come with us because we're taking a journey. We're on this. We're on that. We have all this opportunity around us. If we love Jesus as we say we do as a Christian, why aren't we asking people just to follow? Just lean in. I don't want to be a part, I don't want my family, I don't want my grandchildren a part of a church that just believes the right way and behaves the right way and does nothing with it. 
because you get closed off and you surround yourself and we pat each other on the back because, oh, we're holy, we're good. Everybody else outside is no good. I'm deep, I'm shallow, whatever. And we are no heavenly good at all. No earthly good either. Jesus said, follow. He didn't tell people to change. He didn't tell Matthew. You never heard him say, Matthew, you're going to have to change. He said, follow. Follow me. Live with me. Walk with me. The invitation is for anybody. Anybody. I want you to think about this. There's four quick things that I want to go over and bring this thing down. Number one, being a sinner does not disqualify you. In fact, to follow Jesus, it's a prerequisite. We have to be a sinner to follow Jesus. You have to know that we're sick. You have to know that. The second thing is, being an unbeliever doesn't disqualify you. In other words, to follow Jesus, you do not have to believe. You can be a complete atheist and begin to follow Jesus. You say, why would anyone do that? Because you're curious. You're just curious. Do you realize that if you follow the disciples, that their belief, for some of them, did not happen. You didn't hear Jesus say, or them, or them absolutely say, oh, we believe you for two years. Two years. In fact, when it got down to really a hairy situation, you know, the crucifixion, Jesus' trial, they all scattered. They didn't believe anymore. They thought the whole thing was done. It wasn't until the resurrection. And I got to be honest with you. It's like, guys, that's a pretty big deal. It's not hard. Once you see Jesus, you saw him dead. Now he's alive. And uh, you know, now you say you believe. For some of them, three years walking every day with Jesus Christ, they still did not believe who he was. But Jesus never turned them away. Never. We walk with Jesus. They talk with Jesus. All the while, changes were going on. Amazing. Amazing when you think about it, all right? Being a belie- of an unbeliever does not disqualify you. Thomas, he's, think about it. Thomas, even after the resurrection, didn't believe it. All right? Just be aware of that. Be aware of it. Number three, the invitation to follow. When Jesus gives an invitation to follow him, it is purely relational. He wants us to know him. He wants to make the connection. He doesn't make up rules. There's no do's and don'ts. He doesn't say you need to follow the Ten Commandments plus 613 other made-up laws. He doesn't say that at all. It's follow him. It's all about relationship. He's in love with us. It's unconditional love. The fourth one, this is a big one. Following, when I follow Jesus, it forces me to focus on where I am. Where I am, not where you are. When I want to focus, when I look in that mirror and I ask myself the question, am I a follower? Is my life reflecting that I follow Jesus? I'm looking at me. I don't look over at you and compare where you're at, what you're doing. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't ask people to do that. He told us not to do that. Don't don't worry about other people. When Peter asked Jesus, you know, after he talked to him in the shore and said about feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, he said, what about John? What about that guy? And what did Jesus tell him? Peter, don't worry about John. I have a plan for him. Don't worry about him. It's not your thing. And that's what following Jesus is. That's what's looking and saying, am I a follower? Am I following? Am I actively following? This whole series, this whole series is about one word. 
follow. The challenge for all of us is to ask that question. Am I following Jesus? You ready to go on a journey? I am. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, I am excited about the challenge. Thinking about this challenges, Lord, some of our biases and some of our mindsets, some of how we think it's got to be or whatever, and yet it's not what you did. But I am a follower of you. And I want every person I know come in contact to be a follower also. So Lord, as we enter into this service and in these parts of following over the next few weeks, I just pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds, open our eyes to your direction so we may see what relational, what relational following is all about. And may we follow you closer and ask others to come along. I ask it, Lord, in your name. Amen.